Today, yes, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the thing that I will insist on calling Sunburst because SolarWinds is in fact the name of my employer and not the name of a vulnerability. Um, and from here, we will use uh, my company's lovely template. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm Trevor. I'm from Austin. I've been a principal architect at SolarWinds um, for about four years, and I specialize in the CI, CD, and uh, DevOps area of the SaaS side of the business. Um, I do a lot with Go and Kubernetes and all lots of fun things. Um, if you're familiar to anybody attending the CNCF con. Um, and I've been doing a lot of that kind of stuff for about the last five or six years. Before that, I spent a lot of time building um, penetration testing tools, offensive security products. And um, so when the big bad stuff happened last December, um, I didn't know anything about the product that was compromised because I'm not on that side of the business. So they asked me to start thinking about what would come next. Um, so what does SolarWinds do? We, um, I guess the big headline is that we're the market leader in network management software. Um, most of the Fortune 500, I think about 80% of it uses our stuff. Um, pretty much every government agency you can name, universities, uh, mom and pop shops, all the way up to tier one network providers. No matter who you have for an ISP at home, chances are they are probably using the Orion platform somewhere to monitor um, big Cisco routers or to help run their NOCs or things like that. Um, in the last five, and si five or six years, we've also bought a number of um, SaaS offerings that you might be familiar with. Things like Pingdom and Logly and Paper Trail, a lot of things in the APM and event space. Um, we have over 50 products because we've been around for around 20 years and have um, been buying things that whole time. And one of those was compromised in the attack known as Sunburst, and that's the Orion platform. So this talk is 30 minutes long, um, which is not nearly enough time to give like a comprehensive introduction to supply chain stuff and uh, or to take you through every aspect of what we're doing. I'll be leaving out some things around securing dependencies, around how we leverage SBOM files in the build process, um, the merits and pitfalls of signing every git commit, um, and some of the deeper details um, of how we're trying to dig in and get around some of the um, surface level non-determinism of certain build technologies. Uh, we do intend to open source everything that we've been building sometime over the next couple quarters. So obviously in the coming months, we'll have a lot more technical detail available. Um, but what I'm gonna focus on today is what we call internally pipeline mechanics. Um, and that then I'll end the talk with sort of a grab bag of implementation details. And folks, of course, can ask questions after that, um, which I will answer as best I can. Um, fair warning, I can't necessarily talk about some things that you might have questions about with regard to things that maybe didn't come out in the media around Sunburst. Um, but I don't even really know that much secret stuff anyway. So um, but I'll do my best. I think it's important to define what we mean when we say the supply chain attack. So Google has a pretty good, um, very general definition, which is just simply unauthorized modifications to software packages, right? But I'd like to take that a step further and say that we can divide that into a couple different categories. We've got third-party code compromise. That would be something like CodeCov, right? A thing that you use in your system got compromised, and then because you included it in your system, your build process, or whatever, your thing got compromised. There's a first party code compromise, which, or not even code, sorry, first party compromise, which is what happened to us at SolarWinds, right? A system that we own, that we maintain, um, was compromised and some bad things were done as a result of that access. And then as kind of a joke, I've added like a third type here, which I'm not sure um, if it even represents it because I don't know if Microsoft ever has um, divulged exactly what took place when they somehow were tricked into signing rootkits earlier this summer. Um, if anybody knows, I would love to hear about that later on because as of like a couple months ago, they were still silent about it. But I put it up here with these question marks because maybe it represents like a third style of attack. So what happened in Sunburst? Um, I'll first say that there is an amazing blog post from FireEye who um, was the security vendor that originally discovered this and it is insanely detailed. And if you want to know absolutely everything possible to know about the malware and about sort of, you know, the way that it works, you can dig in and if you just Google FireEye Sunburst blog post, you'll find it. Um, but basically what happened was our build system, the Orion build system, um, based on TeamCity, and not the Kubernetes version, but the kind with like long running VMware based build, build agents was compromised. And as with any hack, um, attribution and initial vectors of compromise can be extremely difficult, if not impossible to ascertain for certain. Um, but what we do know is that once they gained access into our dev network, they found our build agents and they put a malicious DLL at the right moment in there. If you don't know what a DLL is, it's just a library. It's a piece of compiled uh, Windows code. Um, they actually, we determined they actually kind of um, stuck some dead, dead code into one of our releases. And then um, when they were decompiled it after grabbing that release, they saw that that dead code was there. 
And so they knew that they could then insert something um, more interesting and malicious. Um, but there was a lot of uh, sort of camouflage. DLL had a very innocuous name. Um, it used a lot of naming identifiers that um, would have looked normal to any SolarWinds engineer who worked on Orion. Um, this was all directly with compiled code. There were no um, compiled artifacts. There was no source code compromised at all. Um, once it woke up, it would mimic call home traffic to, um, to our stats portal. And um, as with a lot of contemporary malware, it used DNS for command and control, right? So um, it was pretty interesting. It would wake up after some number of days. It was kind of like a random number of hours that would go up to 12 days. Um, and then it would emit a, uh, some DNS request. And then um, depending on what it got back, it would either wake up and do more stuff or it would just stay completely dormant. There were certain IP blocks that it would, if it was found within there, it would, the command and control server would just say, stop, don't do anything. Um, so that was, that was pretty interesting. So um, once we uh, found out about this from FireEye, which happened December 13th of last year, um, we had to start turning the entire company upside down. And that is not just the Orion platform, which all by itself is a pretty big challenge at 10 million lines of code um, developed by you know, thousands of people over two decades, but also everything in our cloud business. Um, we had to rotate every single password and secret across um, you know, dozens and dozens of Amazon accounts. Um, obviously had to decompile huge numbers of build artifacts that we had sitting around um, as part of our process and um, sort of make sure that if we recompiled from source that it matched those DOLs. Um, we wrote custom scanners to deal with um, intermediate formats like PDBs and try to use that also as a basis of truth to sort of find out how, how far back this went. Um, as you can read and probably may have read in the media in the past, um, we discovered that this had existed for about 18 months. They had been inside the system for that long. Um, Folks, like dozens and dozens of people um, from all over the world worked around the clock from December 13th straight through to New Year's Day. Um, we did a kind of a follow the sun thing from our Manila offices all the way to um, our big development offices in Krakow, Poland. So um, in the conclusions that we drew from this, um, first of all, this was a really good adversary. Um, we obviously don't have any way of understanding how it is that people like NSA and GCHQ have said that this was Russian foreign intelligence, but that is what the spooks have told us. And so, you know, we believe them, even though, of course, they deny it. Um, we know now that fewer than 100 customers were affected, which is great because we originally thought that it could have been up to 16,000. And um, SolarWinds was almost certainly attacked because of the nature of the Orion platform itself. Um, like any system that does large scale management and monitoring, Orion has to have a lot of credentials to do what it does. Everything within this product category has to do that kind of thing, right? Because you're basically saying, hey, I've got a system that can log into some other system and pull stats or manage it, run scripts, do all kinds of things. So um, even amongst penetration testers um, you know, who, who hack for a living, good guy hackers who hack for a living, um, Orion has for a long time been you know, something, or these types of systems have been something that's kind of nice to find on an engagement because if you can get in from there, you can pivot widely through the network. Um, we realized also that we were going to need to completely redo um, all of our build infrastructure and kind of rebuild it on uh, much more contemporary and sort of bleeding edge technologies. Um, and that's because obviously this type of thing is not going to go away. Like a, a, an attack that's successful, there's going to be more of them. And, and folks today have already alluded to sort of the um, wide ranging problem of supply chain kind of getting bigger and bigger. So what is the fix? And that's what we'll talk about for the rest of this talk. Um, Project Trebuchet, which is the uh, big cross-functional, the name, internal code name for the cross-functional initiative um, that I've been the lead on, is uh, what we call a consensus attested system, right? So in deciding that we have to rethink like a huge portion of our software development lifecycle, we started to come up with um, really four top level requirements that sort of emanated up um, or bubbled up as, through all of our discussions. The first is we need to move to ephemeral infrastructure. Um, and the advantages of ephemeral infrastructure are not unfamiliar at all to anybody attending a conference um, that's you know, talking about cloud native tech and Kubernetes. So I think people understand that. Um, but just moving, just straight up moving away from long live build agents gets you quite a bit more uh, security than you would have had in the past if you're kind of always using the same machines that are always on. Um, obviously you want determinism wherever possible, which is a really interesting challenge because most or quite a few technologies don't actually support the ability for you to uh, build something from the same exact inputs, like the same point in your code base and the same collection of dependencies and get the same thing twice, right? For instance, um, if you want to build a container image that um, is the exact, has the exact same SHA from the exact same source code, um, you can't do it with build kit, right? You can't do it with Docker. You need to go and find some other um, thing like Kaneko or one of these other 
technologies that sort of supports that. Um, you know, you can build a Java jar this way with Maven with like a reproducible flag, et cetera, but some things just don't support it yet. Like for instance, .NET, you cannot yet get a completely deterministic um, binary. So what that means is, you know, you go, for instance, you want to download Firefox. You download Firefox and you can compare um, the SHA that they put online to, um, you can, you know, run open SSL and you can generate a digest and you can say, oh, the binary that I got was the binary that they, they expected to send me. These bits are good. Um, but it's most likely that, and I don't know that's for certain about Firefox, but it's most likely that the system that produces that original thing with that particular SHA, they couldn't get that same SHA again, right? But wherever possible, you need to try to go and get determinism. Um, and this is kind of funny because on the salsa levels, there's a little asterisk around determinism because it's just sort of like not everything can do it yet. Um, consensus is the next one. And that means basically just two systems agreeing, right? If you have determinism, then you should be able to build the same thing twice and compare them. And the idea here is that, you know, if this had been possible for an attack like Sunburst, we would have had kind of the regular system that everybody uses and then a side system that's much more secure that um, has fewer people have access to. And that thing could be a source of truth and say, hey, um, these two things didn't match and therefore some shenanigans took place. The fourth thing is um, proof, kind of recording everything that happens in the course of a build, right? And you'll hear a lot about this today as, as people talk in depth about things like Intoto um, and stuff like that that helps you kind of capture everything that's going on um, in the course of a, of a software build. Um, but yeah, you need to be able to have some level of understanding of, of each step and ensure that it's kind of concrete. And then on top of all that, we have this thing that helps us guide our thinking um, is on this project. And um, this is what we call the golden rule of trebuchet. And it's an overarching principle that helps guide both the developer experience and our separation of concerns. Um, and this is really important because without something that can, that can handle this, um, it, well, I should say this helped us kind of decide that certain systems just weren't going to work right off the bat. Um, and particular SaaS offerings. So right away, we looked at Circle and Travis and GitHub Actions to see if those could get us what we needed. Um, as I've mentioned before, SolarWinds has got a lot of different kinds of products, a lot of different kinds of build systems in use, but we're really big fans of SaaS products and um, the ability for developers to have a whole lot of control over what they're doing, as that golden rule said. Um, and we determined pretty quickly that it's not enough to just to be able to self-host, right? Like um, GitHub Actions has a self-hosted runner concept where um, you can take the runner, it's just this kind of opaque job engine, and you can put it on your Kubernetes cluster or your VMware agent or whatever, and you can lock down the network and you can kind of have a lot more security in that posture than you would otherwise, um, but you're still sort of stuck running exactly what comes from that repo in that, in that agent. So um, we decided that we would go with Tekton, because, uh, which is based on Kubernetes, because that would give us um, the desired mechanics, but it would also um, give us that kind of all important uh, developer experience that we wanted. And to go a little bit deeper on that on why it won't work, um, if you think about how Circle and Travis and GitHub Actions, and I think um, most of the cloud vendor CI solutions work, um, the entire build definition from top to bottom lives in the repo. Um, the mechanisms for not repeating yourself are primitive and not really enforceable. Um, Circle CI has this concept called orbs, right? And that's their library. Well, there weren't private orbs until just a little bit earlier this year. If you wanted a private orb, you had to have like a little hack to keep it private. Um, GitHub Actions still today, private actions, um, you have to spam the copies around your repos. And so you can't just share a single library and do it all over the place unless you want to open it up. And um, that obviously doesn't scale very well. And kind of the main thing here, though, is that there's no um, interstitial authority that can add anything to what the developers are doing. We don't want the developers to have to think too much about security and validation. And indeed, we don't want to put any of those controls in their hands, right, per the golden rule. Um, we need to be able to bring those receipts, as people say, um, for every bit of the standardization and enforcement that we do. And so we have to be able to separate this out, right? So Kubernetes is actually really good at architectures that involve you um, submitting like a resource definition that you've written and then have that thing kind of get augmented and modified by the system, right? You can think about things like how Istio works, where it injects an Envoy sidecar into every pod. You don't have to think about that. It just sort of happens for you. Um, so the idea that we could easily mutate user-supplied um, definitions was really attractive to us. And also, this is a great dev experience. Um, we're big fans now of Tekton. Tekton is, is not the oldest project in the world. It's still got some rough edges. Um, but anybody that we show this to who's used to something like Circle or GitHub Actions um, really takes to it pretty quickly. Um, you write YAML. You define tasks. And tasks have steps. Steps run in a container image. Um, there's great semantics for being able to share data, for passing data around, surfacing up results. 
Um, you can have tasks inlined, or crucially, you can reference heavily parameterized tasks that live in a separate repo. You can have a catalog. So yeah, that makes it easy to not repeat yourself. It makes it easy to standardize. It makes it easy to enforce people using particular versions of new things that you've done. Um, and this is how we started to be able to reason about scaling a system up to hundreds and then eventually thousands of engineers working all over the world. Um, so I guess the, the kind of the TLDR here is that we, we can't use the SaaS stuff, but we really want to preserve the basics of that SaaS experience. Okay, cool. So we have technology that will let us separate concerns. It will allow us to follow that golden rule of making sure that the developers um, write their own stuff and they're not involved in making sure that, uh, that it's validated and enforced and secured. Um, we've got a SaaS experience that the developer's familiar with. So the next thing is to tie it to GitHub. Um, we are GitHub Cloud users, very heavily um, invested in that. And while Tekton has a lot of great stuff, it's actually pretty general. And um, some of those ways that it, it sort of default communicates to GitHub, we didn't really feel were as secure as we would like them to be. Um, so we built several pieces of uh, kit here, as I say, to um, kind of marry up um, Tekton and GitHub. The first is we have a GitHub app that is the thing that actually kicks off builds. So um, a, GitHub, a GitHub app, in case you don't know, is basically just going to catch a webhook, right? You have it sitting in your um, infrastructure, and um, when a PR is opened or a commit is, is added, um, it fires a webhook with data, and then what this app does is it will fetch the um, repo, it'll extract the pipeline definition from a standard location, and it will sort of validate that it's ready, um, and then it submits it to uh, the Tekton Pipelines controller over REST API. And then, of course, Tekton starts to spawn uh, task runs, which are just instantiations of the tasks defined in the pipeline. Um, and as it does, you know, that task run might want to talk back to GitHub. Um, we keep our cluster from talking to anything but GitHub, but we don't want necessarily any given task to be able to just do whatever it wants with GitHub. So we ensure that it can only talk back through a proxy, which limits the API access that it can, that it can hit. It's got very limited access to the GitHub API surface. Um, so even if there was some kind of compromise, it couldn't just go off and sort of send things back to GitHub um, under the aegis of the token uh, as it wanted. We also have um, a Kubernetes controller um, called our Pipeline Watcher, which reports results back to the GitHub Checks API. So this is um, what reads uh, log lines and status information from the task runs and kind of kicks it back in real time to GitHub. And that gives you this experience that feels um, somewhat like GitHub Actions. Like you click on a tab and you can see all the different checks that have run. You can see them in order. You can click to each of them. You can see um, your log output. And um, if you want to, you can click a link down from there and jump straight over to the Tekton dashboard. But you can really do quite a bit of your work just directly inside GitHub as somebody who's just kind of looking at your PR and, and seeing if it, if it can move forward or not. OK, so this is what the system looks like now at this point, right? We've got um, GitHub, the um, repo. And then it comes in, it hits the app. Um, that other kit box up there is the GitHub stuff that I just mentioned. And then we have a lot of business logic that lives in a mutating webhook. Um, and that's stuff that I could maybe get into in question and answer, but just suffice it to say that like, we kind of need to be able to insert some standardized checks that are wrapped up in uh, custom CLI tools and calls um, to those get injected by the mutating webhook. And that's in part because we do a whole lot of things with on-prem, right? I know that we talk a lot, in, especially in this conference, about containers. Um, but at SolarWinds, we don't have the luxury of focusing only on containers. We have to do quite a bit with on-prem. So a lot happens in that mutating webhook. Um, so then, of course, things hit the Tekton pipeline. Magic happens, and things get built. And they land if they're container images in ECR or in um, S3 if they're built binary artifacts. Um, OK, so now we know that we can build something. And we know that we can honor the dev experience. We can do kind of a good job um, giving an easy uh, experience to devs, and they can have a, a thing that feels quite a bit like they're used to with CircleCI or, or Actions. Um, so now we need to make sure that we can record how we build it. We need to know the provenance of everything. And that's a word that you'll probably hear a lot today. Um, it basically just means where something comes from and um, to some extent what it contains. And we have to be able to um, produce records that hold data that tells you kind of what a build step did and um, what was kind of what the inputs were to that build step. Um, and those records also need some kind of guarantee, right? They have to be signed. You need to know that these came from a certain trusted system, et cetera. And the Intoto project is what kind of helps get, get us started there. Um, how many people here are familiar with Intoto already? Okay, cool. So that's like most of the room. Good job. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, and as you know, then, it solves kind of a lot of the conceptual problems in supply chain security. 
um, and helps give sort of a framework for thinking about a lot of these things. And it's um, a lot of standards are kind of, uh, or sort of de facto standards are kind of emerging out of it. Um, and some really smart people from places like Google are working on taking some of their um, industry knowledge and, and working it into um, these uh, Intoto projects or expansion proposals. Um, so we've been participating quite a bit with Intoto and um, we ended up implementing some specs in Go uh, for some of the things that we wanted to be able to use. Um, and the main thing that we implemented is um, Intoto Expansion Proposal 6, or IT6, um, proposes an attestation format for Intoto based on Salsa's attestation spec. So this diagram here um, is a lot nicer than my diagrams and it comes from um, the Salsa GitHub page. So this is sort of explaining what exactly is meant when um, we say an attestation, when we're talking about a, a Salsa attestation or an Intoto IT6 attestation. So you can think of it really as just um, three major pieces. A subject is the thing that we're actually building. Um, a predicate contains like, it's just like a recipe, like how, how we build it and what, what we use to build it and method and the ingredients. Um, and then of course the signature is the guarantee, right? That some system produced this and, and it is signing saying, hey, this is me and I'm, you should trust me because I signed it. Um, and I know there's lots of t-shirts at this con, but if I leave this con without a dancing robot goose t-shirt, I'm gonna be really, really sad. So if y'all know where to get one, let me know, please. Um, okay, so great. Now we know that we've got like a format for how we're gonna have these documents, like a standardized attestation format. Um, and you know, again, the, the, go back to that golden rule. It says that devs can build what they want, but their workflows, their authoring won't have any role in producing those attestations, right? So those are not going to be part of their workflow definitions. They have to somehow show up some other way in the system. So um, enter Tekton Chains, um, which is a newish controller for Tekton, Kubernetes controller in the Tekton ecosystem. And um, it basically just watches the Kubernetes um, API for completed task runs. So when a, a task run is done and it's just sort of marked completed, um, then chains will produce an attestation and sign it and write it out to the database. And this is, um, this is the mechanism that ensures that no matter what a developer defines, all of her tasks and steps are going to get captured and written out as documents um, and then they can be used from there in other ways. And um, shout out to my colleague Frederick Skrigman who wrote some uh, code to get the um, Intoto IT6 attestation spec into chains. Chains support several different attestation uh, types, but the one that we've been kind of centering on is the Intoto one, so um, extended that and added it. All right, so now our diagram has this extra bit, right? We've got Tekton chains in place, and it's sitting there um, using a KMS backend. Um, never manage your own crypto material if you can avoid it. And um, it's using that to sign and stick those documents into a document database. So great, we've got a pipeline. Pipeline's easy to use, it's got attestations, um, and it's got a database, which means that we can have clients ask questions and say things like, hey, did I get um, an attestation from, from the pipeline? Yes, um, maybe there's some other kind of attestation you might wanna put in there around vulnerability presence or not, right? You can um, query these data, this database to kind of ask those questions. So this is the basic system. But of course, we need more than one system to agree. Right? As we've said before, a unitary system is bad. We had a unitary system with Sunburst and we had no mechanism of validating and you know, bad things happen. So we really want consensus to get our consensus to tested system. We need more than one system in place and those need to agree. Um, so we need another thing that looks exactly like the other one, but we also need mechanisms of making it more isolated than that first one, right? So this is our final diagram. And you can see here that on the bottom, we have now a validation cluster. So we have two completely physically separate clusters. Um, and they have, we have the standard cluster, which like our devs will have access to and which GitHub um, sends its webhooks to. And then we have a validation cluster, which looks basically exactly the same other than it gets its marching orders um, by pulling cloud events off an event bus. So what happens is a webhook, um, pull, webhook request comes in to the GitHub app. The GitHub app does all of its validation stuff. It will send one copy off to its own Tekton pipelines controller, and then it will take its um, thing, wrap it up into a cloud event, and emit it on the bus. And then the GitHub app is just configured with a, in a different way on the other, um, in the validation cluster, so it consumes off of that bus instead of off of a bound port getting um, HTTP. And um, we actually don't allow any ingress whatsoever into the validation cluster other than obviously what's necessary to manage it as a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so that gives us an asynchronous sort of parallel system to do, or to do these builds with. And you can see here that each of them has a copy of Tekton Chains, each of them has their own key, and they're both writing things into the same document database. 
And then from there, um, we actually have a little app that ETLs that stuff into a Postgres database that we use um, to have a variety of other clients kind of ask questions of. So you can sort of imagine that like all of this attestation stuff is great, but like in a document, it's not as easy to kind of blow it out into a, like a relational structure and understand, um, you know, like what builds contain which thing or how many builds came from a given um, Git SHA or, you know, eventually we'll go a little deeper and be able to have um, some, marry up some threat intelligence data with some build artifact data and ask sort of more detailed questions like that. Um, but this little green box here on the right of release gates is basically just things like um, a Lambda job, for instance, that might ask, hey, can I pick something up from the Trebuchet S3 bucket and put it in the on-prem release platform release bucket, um, or S3 bucket? And if, you know, it would say, hey, do I have two systems agreeing on this thing? Do I have the vulnerability posture that I want? If so, yay, I'll do that motion. Another one would be like a Kubernetes validating admission webhook to say, hey, um, this container image that you want me to launch, has it been signed? Um, has it been signed by an authority I trust? Does it have an attestation from each of two pipelines? If so, yay, I will allow it to be launched in the cluster. If not, then I won't. In certain situations, we can't do something that we need to do on Tecton. And so in that case, we actually use Tecton as an orchestrator for other infrastructure um, via an agent. So we're pretty heavy Amazon users. Um, so the agent in this case is baked into uh, an Amazon machine, machine image, an AMI or AMI. Um, and the Tecton task actually launches an EC2 instance with that AMI. Um, it will boot, it'll look for a task on an event bus. Um, it'll perform whatever task it's been told to perform by the Tecton uh, task. And then it will send results back on the same bus. And if the Tecton task gets message indicating it's all good, um, then you know, it will go ahead and shut down that entire EC2 instance because the artifact that it needs has been stuck in a known location on S3 and that EC2 instance is no longer needed, right? So this has us using what would normally be long lived VMs, but we're keeping them ephemeral by controlling this stuff from, from Tecton. And this is, we have this need because again, like we're not just doing containers. Um, I should give you a little bit of background. So, so far we have been, um, we had kind of a hard deadline to ship a bunch of things out of the new environment this summer. And um, they were all on-prem projects based on Java. And they all have a bunch of different types of install targets. I'm talking things like Mac OS, um, you know, OVA, like, like VM images, like all these other things that are just, you basically can't do um, on Tecton at all. So we had to come up with this concept. And because it, it keeps to those original, um, four tenets that I mentioned about ephemerality and um, to, to whatever extent possible reproducibility, et cetera. Um, we felt like this was fine. We'd do this outside of Tecton, but Tecton still knows about it, right? So the things that are happening are still getting captured by Jenkins. Um, some miscellaneous details. Uh, so yeah, we use OPA um, to do some vulnerability analysis. And this is kind of in the early phases. We're thinking about um, just sort of defining policies per project around um, allowed vulnerabilities, exceptions, et cetera. Um, and then we've actually been experimenting with producing our own attestations um, in a slightly different format for um, things that we have determined to have a, a, a decent posture vis-a-vis -vis vulnerability presence. We're pretty heavy users of a tool called JFrog Artifactory, which is where we keep all of our things for, um, all of our dependencies for Node and for Java, et cetera. So we're continually scanning that with one of their um, scanning tools called X-Ray. And then you know, we'll take an SBOM file, um, look at everything inside that SBOM file and produce a vulnerability report from X-Ray based on the things inside there and then compare that with um, policy for that project in OPA and you kind of get a thumbs up or a thumbs down, right? And so if you get a thumbs up, that means you can write an attestation into the database about those vulnerabilities or the, the posture of those. Um, we keep everything locked to GitHub through the pretty nifty fact that GitHub uh, continually publishes their, um, over their meta API the CIDR ranges that all of their, um, their uh, webhooks are gonna come from. So uh, the ALB, the Amazon um, Application Load Balancer that we use has a great feature where it allows you to sort of dynamically keep updated like the allowed IP ranges that you're gonna allow to talk. So we're able to keep it constantly locked to just GitHub. Um, we don't have any other ingress at all into the standard, into standard cluster. Um, and as I said earlier, no egress out of the VPC whatsoever other than to GitHub. So if we were compromised, um, that vector of compromise would have to involve in some way um, talking back to GitHub, maybe pulling some bad thing from GitHub or whatever. But um, as of about a week or two ago, we've actually started red teaming Trebuchet, which is pretty fun. So I've got somebody sitting there trying to see if he can escape from containers and things like that. And, um, we'll, see, we'll see what he comes up with. Um, and now some concluding thoughts since I know I'm very close to my half hour time. Um, 
if you haven't already, like you, you will. I should have said you will, not you'll probably. Like you will experience a breach. Um, it happens constantly. It happens more and more. Uh, it's really hard to secure software. So um, just be humble about this. I know that that's um, kind of facile advice, but it's worth mentioning. It's it's going to be difficult, and the people that um, you're going to work with are going to be from all over your company. One thing I've noticed in the course of all of this is that um, dev teams and, and internal security teams don't talk enough, and that really needs to change. Um, folks on both sides need to make friends with each other, understand each other's worlds, and help each other out. That's something that we on the Trebuchet team have tried to do uh, quite a bit over the last few months. We've staffed up, as you can imagine, in the wake of this breach um, quite a bit within our CISO's office, and all of those people are now um, pretty, pretty well read into everything we're doing, and they understand it, and they're involved with it, and um, that's only going to bear dividends for us over time. Um, move security left as much as you can. Put things into the hands of devs. Devs know the tools. They know the product. They know what they're building. Um, give them the means and the training to understand how to try to prevent themselves from inserting security vulnerabilities in the first place. Um, train people on secure systems design. You're going to get back, again, massive dividends compared to the investment that you do. Um, and as the ancient saying goes, be excellent to each other. I'd like to leave this slide up here for a couple minutes because there are a lot of amazing people um, that helped so much throughout the last 10 months. Like I said, it was really grueling. This collection of folks, um, some are current, some are former SolarWinds people, some are in this room, um, have done just amazing work. And um, this has been probably, it, it's, I, I joked earlier, it, it's 10 months that felt like five years. Um, and the folks on this list have done things from you know, implementing in Toto specs in Go to um, holding hands with extremely freaked out people um, virtually over the phone for hours and hours in the immediate aftermath of the breach. Um, so I know there's people that I missed, but uh, yeah, everybody everywhere, whether you're at SolarWinds or whether you were affected by this or whether um, maybe somebody in your company just ran in with a waving around a ZDNet article saying, hey, we got to do something about this and it uh, ate your world. Um, yeah, thank you too. And um, also I need to observe that today is Indigenous Peoples Day. So yes, um, go out there, teach peace, expect justice. Thank you very much. Oh, there's questions. I'll take yeah, questions. Yeah, awesome talk. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, let me do one virtual question, and then we'll take a couple from okay. the audience. So the first one is, do you have variants across your parallel pipelines? Anything to prevent it, be, anything to pre pre prevent it being easy to pwn both the exact same way, defeating the purpose of the parallel pipelines? Um, variants across the pipelines? No. There, so the only variant is that in the validation, if I understand the question correctly, in the validation cluster, rather than getting direct communication from GitHub, um, it gets asynchronous communication from a message bus. So um, there's nothing going into that second cluster that hasn't at some level already been validated before by a slightly lower assurance system, if that makes sense. So. Um, we double produce everything, right? Like we, we did originally um, try to have uh, like a reduction in the things that we did in the pipelines, in the validation pipeline, but it was just too logistically complex to try to think about how to mutate out certain tasks that didn't make sense within the validation context. So eventually we just decided we'll do the exact same thing in both places. And um, the only thing that we do is we'll um, like update, we'll insert like a, um, a change to like Kaneko to like not push a container, but it'll still, It'll still build an image and calculate checksums and produce attestations around that. And then audience questions. And just speak really loud when you ask the question. Yeah, so the question is about trade-offs, conversations around um, trade-offs in time versus, you know, trade-offs in security, if I understand it right. So um, that really has never been a thing as part of this because um, the nature and the high-profile level of this, um, I don't know if anybody caught this, but, you know, our, our CEO and our former CEO um, both had to testify in front of Congress twice. And they literally promised this system to the United States Congress on live television. So um, there is no one who really cares. I mean, I care deeply about the developer experience, obviously, and, and we do our best to make it as fast as we can. 
Um, but frankly, our experience so far has been that like modulo some temporary problem with like not enough Kubernetes resources. These are as fast or faster on Tecton as they were doing similar motions on Team City or Jenkins. So we we absolutely we instrument everything. You know, we we do all the things that you do to try to make sure that any cloud service runs um, as efficiently as it can. And we don't want anybody to have a bad time with this. Um, but security is like priority one, two, and three, and that's just the way it has to be right now. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yeah, so we're, right, so the question is, what are we using for KMS? Um, and so the, the real answer to what we're using from KMS is um, we're using SigStore. So um, my colleague here, Cody Soyland, actually added some support for AWS KMS backend. Um, it, the, a lot of the stuff in, from SigStore um, is fairly GCP oriented. So there was already support for KMS there and um, for GCP KMS. So um, we on our team added support for AWS KMS. And then it's, you know, if you have a, an IAM role that allows it to request a signature, then it just is allowed to request a signature of some data. And that's, that's basically, you know, what's happening there. So you could conceivably run this on any, uh, anything, you know, as long as you wanted to do the work to make sure, like, I don't know, maybe, I don't think SigStore supports Azure KMS, but it wouldn't, or maybe it does now, okay. Yeah, so you could you could conceivably build this pretty easily on any of the uh, on the big um, you know the big public clouds. Uh, we just have a lot of stuff in Amazon, and you know that's kind of what we're used to. Um, there, our DevOps group is managing the KMS stuff, but it's it's all adhering to a collection of um, requirements that are emanating from our CISO's office. Well, now it's break time. Thank you, Trevor. Awesome. Uh, right. We'll meet back here at 10.30. 20 minutes, 20 minute break. Thanks everybody.